uh, buy that $10 for every quantity that's moving through the market. And now, instead of the socially optimal number of flu shots being 20, which would be the private equilibrium, right? That's the private equilibrium here. Now, because we've recognized the external benefit and the social value is shifted upward or the willingness to pay is shifted upward, and we come down and we find the social equilibrium is 25 shots, not 20. So to internalize that, all we have to do is offer a subsidy of $10. And that's very simple to administer, right? Everybody that comes into the tank center that gets a shot gets $10. And we get to the social optimum. Voila, we're home free. Okay, to summarize, if there's a negative externality, the market quantity uh, is larger than the socially optimum because there's some cost uh, that are being neglected by the sellers of those products. If it's a positive externality, then the market quantity is smaller than the socially optimum. And that's just a simple uh, analysis showing how the demand and supply curve shift. Remember way back when in our lectures when we said, listen, some event comes along, there are three steps that you should go through to evaluate the impact of that event. One, you ask yourself, did demand curve shift? Did the supply curve shift? Did they both shift? Second step, in which direction? Third step, what is the new market equilibrium relative to the old market equilibrium? That's all we're doing here. And the event is offering a subsidy for a positive externality or imposing a tax for a negative externality. Okay, and that is internalizing the externality. Tax goods with negative externality, subsidized goods with positive externality. Jimmy? <laughs> Good. Um, the simple reason is we want more people to take shots because then there's less harm that's going to take place by the migration of the disease. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, coming back to Nicole said about command and control, now we're going to look at command and control, and let me give you a brief, oversimplified history of environmental policies in this country. Initially, all the government policies were initially focused on the following principle. The polluter pays. Regardless, the polluter is responsible for whatever pollution takes place, and we, the government, largely reflecting, quote, environmental stakeholders, we are going to command and control the amount of pollution. And we will inform various polluters what amount of pollution they can generate. Okay. Then, over time, it turned out that those kind of policies were very costly and very inefficient. And thank God the economists stepped forward and said there is a better answer. And it shouldn't surprise you, given everything that we talked about at this juncture, economists came forward and said the right answer is to change incentives, to change the incentives in the private sector so that agents will take into account either the cost that they impose on bystanders or the benefits that they are able to generate. And as a result of those kinds of policies, you'll achieve more efficiency, a larger size of the pie. Uh, the command and control policies, which were originally introduced, specified limits on the quantity of the pollution admitted and or said to firms, the classic example is electric utility companies that are burning high sulfur coal. They said to them, you all must put in scrubbers to remove much of the sulfur from the coal that you're burning, uh, rather than giving them incentives for perhaps finding better technologies that are more cost-reducing than scrubbers themselves. So the second thrust with regard to public policies by the public sector or governments is the market-based policies. And we've already looked at our two simple examples with regard to negative externalities and positive externalities internalizing those externalities. In one case, for the gasoline example, we introduced a tax, right? That is a market-based solution. In the case of positive benefits with regard to fuel, uh, flu shots, we introduced a subsidy and changed uh, the private equilibrium to a social optimum or efficient equilibrium. So the, the best example, and ones we've already discussed, for market-based policies are corrective taxes for negative externalities or corrective subsidies for positive externalities. Another market-based policy that's out there that's discussed by your reading for today, and we'll discuss it in a couple of examples, is using tradable pol pollution permits. You give the polluters so many permits, and then you set up a market for trading among the polluters to achieve greater efficiency than you could achieve through a command and control governmental intervention. Okay? Let's first look at corrective taxes and subsidies. As we've already noted, a corrective tax is designed to induce or provide incentives for the private decision makers to take into account the costs that they impose on others that are not party to their transactions, not direct parties to their transactions. And this is all based on a famous economist, his name is Pagu, um, and he introduced this uh, public policy as a mechanism for the government to correct uh, private inefficient market outcomes to take into account the external costs that are imposed through negative externalities or the external benefits that are imposed through positive externalities. Ideally, the corrective tax should be equal to the external cost. And a, an ideal corrective subsidy should be equal to the external benefit. Right? All right. Now, we've already looked at taxes and subsidies and how they shift the supply and demand curves. In each of those cases, the taxes, sales taxes that we looked at, they detract uh, from economic efficiency. They detract from maximizing total surplus. Right? Why? Because in each of the cases that we investigated, the private equilibrium was the social equilibrium, social optimum equilibrium. Now, that's no longer the case. And as a result, the corrected taxes and subsidies move us from inefficient private outcomes to efficient social outcomes. And what we're trying to do uh, through these corrected taxes and subsidies is align, align the private incentives with the social interest. That's the real purpose. And at the end of the day, we're making the private decision makers take into account the external cost that they impose on innocent bystanders or the external benefits that they're able to generate through their actions. And by imposing these corrective taxes and subsidies, we move the economy from an inefficient outcome, a private sector outcome that's inefficient, toward a socially efficient allocation of scarce resources. Okay, okay corrective taxes versus regulations. 
but we're going to look at an example where you've got a command and control, and we're going to look at how corrected taxes or subsidies, or better yet, tradable permits, give us a socially efficient outcome. Okay? That's where we're going from here. Okay? And what we want, ultimately, is to provide the right incentives so that those firms, talking about negative externalities that are generating pollution, for example, we want those firms that are more efficient in reducing their pollution to respond by doing just that, rather than having no incentive to take into account their greater efficiency with regard to reducing or abating the amount of pollution that would otherwise take place. Okay, pollution tax. A pollution tax is efficient uh, when firms with lower, abasement lower abatement cost are able to reduce their pollution, in turn, to reduce their tax burden. Okay, um, I'm going backwards. Firms with higher abatement cost, they face a trade-off. If they got very high abatement cost, maybe they're better off by just paying the tax, right? Think about it for a moment. I'm a polluting. Put yourself in the shoes of being the decision maker for a polluting firm. Suppose you're producing paper. Uh, and as a byproduct of producing paper, uh, you generate dioxin. It finds its way into the environment. Suppose that there is a tax imposed upon you. And for every ton that you generate, you have to pay that tax. But instead of paying the tax, you could reduce the amount of pollution that you're generating. And it's going to turn on the trade-off between what abatement costs you incur versus what tax you have to pay under the governmental regulations. Right? Make sense? Okay. Now, in a command and control, Instead of getting that trade-off, what happens in command and control is the government comes along and says all firms must reduce the amount of pollution that they're generating by a specific amount. Well, clearly, there's no incentives for the more efficient abatement companies to take advantage of that, right? to recognize that trade-off. Let's look at a concrete example. Uh, correct, just as a few more precursors before we get to the example. Uh, a corrected tax gives the firms incentives uh, to reduce the amount of pollution as long as the cost of doing so is less than the tax. That's the trade-off. Right? And if a cleaner technology becomes available, and that's going to reduce your cost of abatement, reducing the amount of pollution, to avoid the tax, then you're going to do so. You're going to adopt that technology. So one of the big problems here in the United States and many other parts of the world, for governments that don't use these kind of incentives, there's no attempt to innovate, to invest in new, cleaner technologies, uh, because the incentives simply aren't properly structured with regard to the corrected taxes and or subsidies. Mm -hmm. All right, example. Let's look at the gas tax that we spoke about a moment ago. There are three obvious negative externalities that emerge from the use of gasoline in vehicles. One, congestion. Uh, the more you drive, the more you contribute to congestion. Uh, accidents. Larger vehicles cause more damage in an accident. Uh, pollution. Burning more fossil fuels produces more greenhouse gases. All of those are negative externalities. And if those external costs can be monetized and quantified, then you can impose a tax on the use of gasoline, which will, quite obviously, end up reducing the equilibrium from what would otherwise be the private market equilibrium. Okay, let's look at a specific example. And, let's, and this is going to illustrate the trade-off between abatement versus paying the tax on the amount of sulfur dioxide that is generated from two electro electrical utility companies, both of which are burning coal. Um, let's suppose, in this fact pattern, that each admits 40 tons of sulfur dioxide per month. So the total amount admitted is 80 tons per month. And suppose the government goal, after they completed a number of studies with regard to the health impact of sulfur dioxide, come to the conclusion that the sulfur dioxide emission should be reduced by 25%. So the goal is to reduce it to 60 tons per month. And let's suppose, in addition, that Acme is a much more efficient abater. That is to say, to abate a ton of sulfur dioxide only costs them $100. While use is far less efficient, it costs them twice as much. Okay? Let's suppose the command and control regulation is that every firm must cut its admission by 25%. So each of them would have to reduce their amount of sulfur dioxide admissions by 10 tons. What is the cost in terms of scarce resources to implement that policy? So your task is to compute the cost to each firm and the total cost of this command and control policy. Go ahead and visit with your neighbors. Give it some thought. It shouldn't take you but a moment. Okay, Clifford, what's the answer? Say what? Uh huh. So the total is? Yes, exactly. So that's very straightforward. So the answer is if each is required to reduce it by 10 tons, it turns out that the total cost, Acme is going to incur a cost of 1,000, use is going to incur a cost of 2,000, the total cost is 3,000. Now, the second learning example is where the real content is. Let's look at tradable pollution permits. Um, and once again, the facts are exactly the same. Each of them is admitting 40 tons of sulfur dioxide per month. Once again, the goal is to reduce the total emissions to 60 tons. So you're reducing it by a total of 20, right? Same, same facts. Now, in contrast to a com command and control policy, we're going to impose tradable pollution permits. Now, how would you implement this? The government would come along and issue 60 permits. Each permit allows one ton of sulfur dioxide to be admitted. And to get to their goal of 60, they're going to grant only 30 permits, right? And simultaneously establish a market for trading those permits. Now, in your thought process with regard to evaluating this, recognize that each firm can admit less than 30 tons and sell their permits. Another firm can admit more if it buys additional permits. Right? This is cap and trade. The cap is 60 tons. That's the cap. Then you're going to allow these firms to trade, all the while having to achieve that target or that cap. Okay, your task, 
is to compute now the cost uh, if it turns out that use and ACME enter into an agreement where ACME buys 10 permits, pardon me, use buys 10 permits from ACME and it pays $150 for each. Visit with your neighbors, tell me what the answer is. the penalty to US oh, if they violate the permits but but if they just if acne you said if right right okay but the point is would they be better off selling it or holding it well then they're gonna pursue their economic self-interest why wouldn't they sell it oh if they were competing that's a different story no 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 you're, no, you're adding a, another dimension to the problem yes you, it is possible if they were direct competitors there might be an incentive to try to put them out of the business and use as their compare, comparative advantage the fact that they have lower cost of the paper right okay any volunteers? Somebody want to explain this with great clarity? Yes. Oh, wait, why aren't you in your seat? You were late, I see. So you're hiding out. Now you're coming forward. Go ahead, tell us the answer. Uh, so, Acme will have to pay um, 20 to 20, but it can sell an additional 10 to USC. So, if it's not more than 100 billion, it's going to be sold to Precisely. So, if they possibly have to Yes. And then USC, who can commit to 40, will have to pay Acme. So, the 10 Exactly, she's right on. Perfect. Um, so, just repeating exactly what she said. Uh, Acme sells 10 permits, get $1,500. With regard to the remainder, remainder they incur an abatement cost of $2,000, right? Uh, so the net cost to them is only $500 because they get $1,500 from selling the 10 permits and they incur a cost of $2,000 for uh, the 20 uh, tons that they end up admitting. Now, what happens with regard to use, the, the less efficient abater? Uh, it buys the 10 permits, it costs $1,500, uh, and they admit a full 40 tons, which, what, which is what they were admitting before, right? They spend nothing on abatement, hence the net cost to them is $1,500. So the total cost, the societal cost, if society is composed only of these two firms, the total cost is 2000 which is much more efficient than the command and control learning example that we went through previously, because there it was 3000 right? So we've saved one-third by introducing these tradable permits. All right, let's move on. Tradable pollution permits. A tradable pollution permit reduces pollution at a lower cost than command and control regulations. If and only if there's some heterogeneity in the cost of abatement for different firms. If they all had exactly the same cost, right? There wouldn't be any trading of pollution permits. Okay, firms with higher cost of reducing pollution by permits and those with lower cost end up selling them. And as a result, the pollution reduction is concentrated among those firms with lower cost. This is the economic prescription in contrast to the environmental or, since most of our politicians are trained in law, the lawyer prescription. Okay. Now, tradable pol pollution permits have been introduced. The first was introduced in the U.S. in 1995, tradable permits for sulfur dioxide. In the northeastern part of the United States, there's been tradable permits for nitrogen oxide. Uh, carbon emission permits have been traded in Europe since January of 2005. Here in the state of California, there's a cap and trade program that was scheduled to be introduced in January of 2012. There's some delay, but there's still an expectation that it will be introduced with respect to carbon emissions. Uh, and if we go back to the election of 2008, both presidential candidates from each of the two parties, both of them argued in support.